My son spent a great part of his early life in and out of his pediatrician's office. It seemed like every other week he had a respiratory infection, middle ear infection, or some other ailment. And of course, he'd be prescribed antibiotics, and so words like amoxicillin and uh, clavulonic acid became part of my everyday vocabulary. Because of this, I estimated that he had spent about 180 days on antibiotics in his first two years of life. And man, those times are tough. But the worst was when he had to have a chest x-ray to uh, confirm or rule out pneumonia. Now, at his age, he wasn't what I would describe as a uh, sit and still kind of kid. <laughs> and so, in order for them to do this, he had to get strapped into an apparatus that I can only describe as a mini electric chair. <laughs> he looked up to me as if to say, Dad, please make this stop. Now, as a father, I felt powerless. But as a scientist, I asked myself, how can I fix this? I spent part of my career as a biomedical researcher and professor at the LSU School of Veterinary Medicine studying bacteria and their growing resistance to antibiotics. And, and I'd like to take a little bit of time this afternoon to tell you about our recent findings in the laboratory. Now, there are certain compounds and drugs that specifically target processes within the bacterial cell that are required for microbial life. And these compounds all have the same goal, stop the bacteria from growing and replicating, and thus killing it. But bacteria are fascinating in that many of them have figured out multiple mechanisms by which to essentially render these drugs ineffective. In other words, certain commonly prescribed drugs no longer function as originally intended. Now, exactly how do bacteria become resistant to antibiotics? Well, there's at least three different ways. Simply put, they can either block them, pump them out, or degrade them. In a class of bacteria called gram-negatives, certain antibiotics are simply too large to enter into the bacterial cell. Therefore, they never actually get to their intended target. Other bacteria utilize what are called efflux pumps that essentially pump out the antibiotic as soon as it gets into the cell, and yet other bacteria utilize specialized enzymes called beta-lactamases to break down or physically degrade antibiotics like amoxicillin, ampicillin, and penicillin. Now, the fact that these bacteria can be pretty sophisticated and somewhat aggressive might sound like the perfect plot for a doomsday Hollywood blockbuster movie. But not all is lost. Instead of focusing on that doomsday scenario, we come up with new solutions to these problems. As an alternative to developing new drugs and antibiotics, which, you know, we still do, by the way, there was a growing emphasis on not reinventing that same wheel. Now, several years ago, colleagues of mine and I had this idea that was somewhat radical for our field. Why not take drugs that are FDA approved and are commonly utilized to treat other ailments like heart disease, high blood pressure, depression, and anxiety, and try to determine whether or not any of those would be effective in stopping bacterial, viral, or even parasitic infections. Now, to be perfectly honest, we had absolutely no idea if this was going to work, but we figured we'd give it a shot. It was either find those alternatives or get taken over by bacteria, no! <laughs> but in all seriousness, uh, when we started thinking about this strategy, we found the benefits to it to this line of investigation. These drugs are already FDA approved and are safe for use in humans. And potentially repurposing these drugs lessens the need to develop new drugs, which can take a really, really long time to get from the patient or to get from the laboratory to the patient and can cost a lot of money. Also, using this strategy might actually lessen antibiotic resistance.
Now, let me break that down for you. An intracellular bacteria requires a healthy host cell to do what it does, and that is to grow. And that growth is governed by a multitude of complex processes and interactions between the bacterium and the host cell. Now, in the past, our strategies have focused on the bacteria to stop it from growing. But as the bacteria develop resistance to antibiotics, we've been unable to stop that bacterial growth and keep that host cell healthy. Now, in our new way of thinking, we turn our attention to that healthy host cell by using a new set of drugs that targets processes within the host cell itself that the bacteria actually might need, we stop those processes from happening. We keep the cell alive, we stop the bacteria from growing, and we potentially prevent antibiotic resistance. The research and development on these drugs has already been done. The toxicology has already been done. So what we're essentially doing is repurposing these drugs for alternative uses. In my laboratory, we study a class of bacteria from the genus Rickettsia. Now, these bacteria are typically transmitted to mammals and humans by the bite of a blood-feeding arthropod like a tick. Now, Rickettsial infections or spotted fever group infections are usually effectively treated by a broad-spectrum antibiotic called doxycycline. But in some cases, that antibiotic doesn't work very well or at all, and the patient starts to suffer a high fever, a really nasty rash, and that can progress to respiratory distress, kidney dysfunction, liver failure, and sometimes even death. So at the molecular level, what makes these bacteria so infectious to humans? So in order to address this question, we take human cells, and we put them in a cell culture dish, and we allow them to grow. And then we infect them with our bacteria of interest, in this case, various Rickettsia species, and determine the rate at which they grow intracellularly. Now, in doing this, we determine that Rickettsia species can proliferate and grow very well and very quickly in a variety of different human host cell types. We then tested several hundred FDA and not FDA-approved drugs to determine whether any of them would exhibit antimicrobial activity in the cell culture dish. In other words, could we stop the bacteria from growing but keep the cell healthy all at the same time? And when we did this, we found out something actually pretty amazing. When we added these FDA-approved drugs to the cells, and then infected them with Rickettsia, we determined that a subset of these drugs were effective in stopping bacterial growth. And these are drugs that we already know about, drugs that are marketed for hypertension, anxiety, even weight loss. Now, finding that a drug is effective in blocking growth of a bacterium in a cell culture dish is great, it's a fantastic finding, but it's far removed from determining whether or not those subsets of drugs would be effective in an actual human patient. But it's a good place to start. But again, why are these studies so important? Let me paint you a scenario. You are traveling to a country that you really, really want to scratch off your bucket list. And being the careful travelers that you are, you get all the vaccines and take all the necessary precautions that your physician recommends to you. But your physician also informs you that in that country on your itinerary, there are prevalent dangerous bacterial infections for which there are no vaccines, and there's now recent reports that those bacteria are no longer responsive to the standard antibiotic regimen that's recommended for that part of the world. Now, what would you do? Would you cancel your trip? Or would you maybe feel a bit safer knowing that you could protect yourself by taking something other than an antibiotic? <laughs>
Now again, the caveat for our studies is that we've demonstrated efficacy in antimicrobial activity in a cell culture plate, which is not the same from demonstrating whether or not it will exhibit that same activity in an animal. Now this is where animal models of, di of disease play a crucial role for biomedical research. Fortunately, small animal models like mice often very nicely replicate aspects of human disease, and we've effectively utilized the mouse model in our laboratory to determine how bacteria ultimately overcome the immune system and cause severe disease. We are in the process of utilizing this model to determine whether that subset of FDA-approved drugs that we found exhibited antibacterial activity in the cell culture dish would also exhibit that same antimicrobial activity in a living, breathing animal. Now, it's the hope and the goal of these studies that if we identify subsets of drugs that are effective in the animal, then these might as actually serve as springboards for future studies, and maybe even clinical trials in humans. Now, thankfully, my son is a healthy and active, now soon to be nine-year-old boy. And aside from his yearly visits to his physician, he hasn't needed to go to his physician uh, just for yearly checkups. But aside from members of my family, what about people who are most at risk and vulnerable for these infections? What about, say, children who live in areas of the world where dangerous infectious diseases like tuberculosis are very prevalent, and for which the bacterium that is responsible for that disease now no longer responds to the majority of antibiotics that we have available in the clinic. What do we do then? How can we help? So here we are now, utilizing current and old drugs to solve new problems. And it's the hope that maybe sometime in the not-too-distant future, we'll be able to implement these non-antibiotic strategies to treat dangerous infectious diseases all over the world. Now, I still find it pretty amazing and frankly, pretty cool that my laboratory helped find a potential solution for a dangerous problem. And that that solution might have been sitting in my medicine cabinet this entire time. Thank you.